Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that we would continue to be transfixed by your words, that they would pierce our hearts, that we would recognize our great need in turn, that we might receive your great grace. We acknowledge, Holy Spirit, that you are the true teacher and pray that you would stir in our hearts and our minds that we might understand things aright, that there would be a transformation on the inside and a transformation that is evident on the outside. Uh, we, we pray these things, Lord Jesus, confident, and we ask them for your glory and for the good of others. Amen. Happy Place! Heard of it? Uh, it's touring the nation. What uh, first, uh, first exhibit was in Los Angeles is now making its way east and is in Boston. Uh, build as a place to inspire happiness. Uh, one of the Boston Globe writers explains it in this way. It's really a collection of selfie-ready installations. So you can wander through uh, the various exhibits and you can get your picture taken. So according to the organizers, and again I quote, it is all meant to max out your contentment meter. And I interpret it in this way. A happy place is a place for you to take pictures of you so you can place your pictures on social media so that others can affirm you. <laughs> That's a whole lot of use. Uh, by nature, uh, we are uh, self-absorbed. Let's just state the obvious. Um, sin, as you may recall, has been defined as love turned inward, the nice Latin phrase for that. I took Latin in high school. You got to make use of it once in a while. Uh, you know, in, uh, in curvatus en se, which means uh, inward or uh, turned in on one's self. And such warped love is the norm for us. Such warped love has been the norm since the fall. However, in previous generations and in some cultures even today, that self-absorption is held in check. That humility and modesty, at least outwardly speaking, is maintained, but, but not here, not in our nation, not now. Our culture loves to elevate self. Think of it in terms of idolatry. Uh, very much the worship of self. Every self-respecting Jewish person in Jesus' day eschewed idolatry. They took the commandments to heart. There were no graven images. They did not bow down uh, to those created by others. And this was especially true of the religious leaders. However, the Pharisee in Jesus' parable very much engaged in idolatry. He would have fit in quite nicely in our modern culture. Look for yourselves to see what I'm talking about. Look at verses 11 and 12 of our reading from Luke chapter 18. See how many times he uses the personal pronoun I. And when you've counted them up, go ahead and shout it out. How many times? Four different times he very much engaged in I. Idolatry. Perhaps the temple was his happy place. It was his place to talk about himself in the presence of others so that others might affirm him. Uh, we're getting uh, a little uh, ahead of ourselves, and so uh, before we, we travel any farther into the text, let's consider the first two C's of interpreting Jesus' parables. Do you remember what the three C's are? Uh, the first C is context. Uh, the second one is culture. It helps to see the context and the culture before we grapple with the content 
Uh, before we ask the questions, what is it saying? And what is it saying to us? So what is the context? Uh, this is week five, and, and in the previous four weeks, we've not had to scratch our heads and say, I wonder what the context is. Uh, here it's laid out clearly, verse 9, I have a little bit different translation. And Jesus also said to some who were trusting in themselves that they were righteous and who were despising others, he told them this parables. Again, parables are not random stories. Jesus just isn't hanging out. You've got to amuse the kids somehow. You've got to keep the crowds hanging on. He wasn't just engaging in, in random stories, but those parables came out of real-life circumstances. And so what gives rise to this particular parable is that Jesus notices that there's a heart issue. And what is the heart issue? He says, some are so full of themselves, they think too highly of themselves and too lowly of others. That on the scale of one to ten, guess what? They are the Bo Derek of, uh, you know, for those of you who are old enough, they're the Bo Derek uh, of law keepers. They are tens. Uh, and then they look at the others around them and they're underachievers. Maybe they are ones and twos. And because of that, they are to be despised as slackers. A couple of uh, cultural aspects to consider. Jesus said two men went up to the temple. What's the significance of the temple? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a place where God condescends to meet with his people. That although one of God's characteristics is that he's omnipresent, which he means he's everywhere all the time, uh, he was there more than he was other places. I know that's hard for us to wrap our minds around, but, you know, omnipresent, but he chose in his mercy to be more there than he was other places. And because God uh, desired to be united to his people, sin always separates. Isaiah says, your sin has separated you. And so if God is condescending to be in the midst of his people and sin is an issue by which there is separation, the temple was then the place of sacrifice. Two times a day, every morning at 9 a.m. and every afternoon at 3 p.m., a sacrifice of atonement was offered for the people. And the Jewish people would often come at 9 and or 3 o'clock to pray. And after the sacrifice was offered, after the separation was dealt with, after the sin was atoned for, they would offer up their prayers. And perhaps as Jesus tells this story, uh, that is what underlies it, that the sacrifice has been offered. The Pharisee and the tax collector along with others gather to pray. And speaking of prayer, two things about Jewish prayer, its posture and its practice. They stood up to pray, and, and we often stand up to pray, at least when we gather in this place. But typically, they would not only stand up to pray, they would look up to pray with their eyes open and occasionally their hands up, and how different that is for most of us. We kind of scrunch and close. Somehow, we get better prayers if we just kind of scrunch in. You ever seen people, like you know, you're praying, it's like, okay, yep, I'm going to do it. Don't look at me. Uh, so that was their posture, and then their practice was, even when they were offering their own prayers, they would pray aloud. And a good number of us don't like to pray aloud. And if we were praying in the presence of the Lord, we wouldn't necessarily want other people to hear uh, the things that we are saying. But for them, that was the norm. Uh, they, they, they prayed aloud and they also read aloud. 
So for those who were literate, they didn't have their little cozy corner in which they had their scroll or book, and they read to themselves that if they were in a room, even by themselves, they read aloud, just the way you did things. Uh, There's an incident in Acts chapter 8 in which you read about that. Uh, Post-resurrection, post-Pentecost, Philip, the angel of the Lord, tells him, go to a certain intersection. Okay, goes to a certain intersection. A chariot goes by, and in that chariot is the Ethiopian eunuch. And the angel of the Lord says, catch up to the chariot, and so he gets his best going. And it says in Luke, or in Acts chapter Uh, 8 verse 30 then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet so in antiquity especially among the Jewish people they read and they prayed aloud so with those little tidbits of the cultural aspect let's press on to the content verse 11 The Pharisee, having taken his stand by himself, began to pray these things. So Jesus says the Pharisee sets himself apart from everybody else who is gathered at the temple, in part because he doesn't want to be defiled by those who have gathered there. Uh, The sad thing is he doesn't recognize that he's got the same need as everybody else who has come there. He stands apart from everybody else, but positions him in such a way that when he prays, again, prays aloud, that other people will be blessed to hear the things that he says. And let's consider, as Jesus tells the story, the content of his prayer. Oh God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Translation, I thank you for making me, me. And the idolatry continues. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes on everything I obtain. So in his self-congratulatory prayer, he brags that he not only keeps the letter of the law, but he exceeds the letter of the law. And that others were to listen and to learn how to live out a life of faith. But what I find most striking is not the Pharisee's arrogance, is that he doesn't ask for anything. He seeks nothing, and he gets absolutely nothing. Jesus says he goes home empty-handed. He doesn't go home with a right relationship with God. And what about the tax collector? His position and posture are markedly different. Uh, He stands apart from the rest, not because he views himself better than they are. He actually sees himself as chief of sinners. He doesn't raise his head and eyes heavenward, but he refuses to look heavenward and he beats his chest a sign of great sorrow. And while he begins in the same way in which the Pharisee does, O oh God, the content of his prayer is much different. It is an idolatry, but rather he cries out for God's mercy. And Jesus says, this one is the one who goes home forgiven. This is the one who goes home in a right relationship with God. I believe that what this parable does is that it reveals two opposing spiritual conditions. One is prideful, the other is humble. As someone wrote, one lifts up his deeds to God and the other lifts up his sins to God. One majors in self, in idolatry, look at me. And the other majors in God, having looked at his own heart and the condition of his life, he recognizes how deeply he needs God's mercy. How we approach God matters. Think about that for a moment. How we approach God matters. Even though 
they may not be as boastful as the Pharisee is in Jesus' parable. Countless people place their hopes on the fact that they are good people. Right? We hear it all the time. Um, Does God answer your prayers? Yes, he does. Uh, More importantly, when you die, you're going to heaven? Absolutely. How can you be so certain? I'm a good person. This is, at least in most people's mind, the way in which God decides in or out, in or out. Oh, good, there you go. And evidently, God grades on a curve. So if we are only reasonably good, then we have absolutely nothing to fear. In truth, though, if that is our approach to God, then we have absolutely everything to fear. That if we are are so full of ourselves, look at me, then we're really not seeking anything and we don't get anything. That if we're holding up our deeds to God, shrugs his shoulders, you can have those. On the other hand, if we're like the, the, the tax collector and the only thing we have to hold up to God is not our good deeds because the scriptures say that even our best deeds are like filthy rags, that apart from Jesus they mean nothing. If we recognize the only thing we have to give God in truth are our sins. If we acknowledge our need and his mercy, then we receive that mercy in its fullness. If you look at Jesus' summation in those final verses, he reveals this, what's been termed the great reversal. And he describes the great reversal in this way, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Here's the question, humbled and exalted by whom? Who does the humbling and who does the exalting? God does. Remember a few weeks ago I gave you this wonderful phrase, divine passives? Uh, That's what it is. God is implied when you read that, you ought to say, "Hmm, I wonder who's doing the exalting. I wonder who's doing the humbling. It's a divine passive. The one who does it is God himself. And God engages in the, the great reversal because he has already accomplished the great reversal in Christ which Paul so eloquently lays out in Philippians chapter 2, which Derek referenced on Wednesday when he preached. Philippians 2, verses 5 and following. In your relationships with one another, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage but made himself nothing. By taking the form of a servant being made in human likeness, think temple that God draws near to humanity in Christ Jesus. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So Jesus is that once and for all atoning sacrifice. He is the temple and he is the priest and he is the sacrifice. And so that is the humility and here's the great reversal. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Our hope in this life and our hope for the next life is not rooted in self. It is to God's glory that we look unto Christ Jesus alone. The one who humbled himself unto death for us and was exalted so that we who are humbled in our sin might be exalted so that we might be like the tax collector. That in Christ and through faith in him we might receive forgiveness that our relationship with God might be restored and that we might go home and one day go home uh, 
happy indeed. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would help us to get over ourselves. It is amazing how self-absorbed we can be, social media-wise or otherwise. And even when we approach you, that somehow, because of what we've done, that you're impressed by that? That somehow that undoes or, or weighs out all the things that we failed to do, the ways in which we didn't love you with all of our hearts and failed to love others as we love ourselves. Help us to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you don't grade on a curve but on the cross. And because you have graded in that way, no matter what we have done or failed to do, uh, there is for us in Christ the one who is humbled and exalted forgiveness and everlasting happiness. Work genuine faith in our hearts that we would come before you and that we would give you what we have that we might receive from you all that you have. And for that, we are grateful. We pray all these things in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen.